Hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Brian Torkelin. I'm program director that oversees the boot camps at the University of Minnesota. And on behalf of the university and to you, we thank you for being here. Um, we're very happy with the turnout, and it's been, we hate to interrupt the networking, but we have a really, really wonderful panel discussion um, for you this evening. Um, I, this is all I'm going to say. I'm going to turn it over to the two volunteer boot camp graduates that are your alumni leaders and let them tell you a little bit about their background and what we hope to achieve with this group. Thanks. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, to introduce myself, my name is Nathan Perfetti and I serve as an instructor for the Full Stack Web Coding Bootcamp program. Uh, to give you a little bit about uh, my background, you know, uh, back in the day, uh, many moons ago, I myself was a bootcamp uh, student. Uh, once I got done with bootcamp, uh, for many years thereafter, I served as a TA for this particular program. And now I'm actually an instructor uh, for the part-time uh, full stack coding program. So I see a couple of my students uh, in the audience. So happy that you all made it out. Uh, just to get you know, give you some uh, opening remarks here. I think it's so important that we come out like this in real life, IRL, and connect with each other, because again, uh, the past you know few years, uh, everything's been virtual. Uh, we've actually had, uh, the, with the Alumni Association, one previous event so far, uh, but not IRL. And uh, it, you know, IRL is definitely better, and so we're definitely looking forward to cultivating this community in the Twin Cities metro area amongst uh, all, your, uh, all you boot camp uh, graduates. And I uh, do also want to uh, give you a tip off. Um, we're in the midst of planning our next event, and tentatively, uh, We'll most likely take the summer off. However, uh, in the fall, we're thinking about uh, in the same location around September 28th is when uh, we're thinking we'll have our uh, next event. So yeah, looking forward to seeing you all then and enjoying the evening. So thank you so much everyone for coming out. Really appreciate you all. Hello everyone, my name is Marianne Pagery. I'm the other co-president of the alumni group and I can't tell you how thrilling it is to see everybody in person. This is the first in-person event that the University of Minnesota boot camps have done since the before times. So it's really great to see everybody. I was a pandemic boot camp graduate myself. I graduated in December of 2020. Uh, from the data analytics program, and my career has been something of a choose-your-own-adventure novel. I got a master's degree in international politics, and then I did Peace Corps, and then I was a recruiter, and then I worked for a couple other government agencies, and then about five months into 2020, I realized, like many of us do in major life-changing circumstances, I needed a job change. So I enrolled in the data analytics boot camp, uh, fast forward to my graduation at the end of 2020 and I started to seriously question what I had done because I couldn't find a job, it felt hopeless. I was working with career services because you guys, federal resumes are super weird and I needed like remedial resume help. So I worked with career services, they taught me how to actually make a real resume that humans use, which was good. And about five months after graduation, I got my first job. I tied together my recruiting experience with analytics and I became an HR analyst. Uh, after that, I moved on to a new position. And so I've, I've also uh, recent, well, in the last five months started a position as a people technology analyst. So there, there is life after boot camp. There are careers after boot camp. It just takes a little bit of work. Uh, that's a little bit about me. And uh, you know that, that whole journey is why we're trying to get this group up and running. We want to build those connections. We want to build those support structures. So when you're there in your job hunt, seriously questioning every life choice you've made for the last six months, you've got someone you can talk to. You've got someone who's made that career pivot, who can help you work through it, give you some tips and, and tricks. So that's why we're really excited to be getting this off the ground today. 
But obviously, you're not here to listen to me today. You're here to listen to our panel of speakers. So I am going to hand things over to Casey, our resident Minnesota tech champion and guru, and he is going to take it away. Well, thanks, everyone. It's awesome to see so many people here on the very first beta test of the alumni event. Uh, show of hands, how many of you are actually still in a program you have not graduated yet? Raise your hand. Cool, about 10% of the room. Raise your hand if you have graduated from a bootcamp program. Raise your hand. Cool, it's about 80% of the room. Okay, keep your hand up if you are currently employed full-time at a company or an employer of some sort. Cool, cool, it's probably about 20% of the room. Uh, raise your hand if you've actually, since you've graduated, actually had two employers, meaning you're actually on your second employer, second job since bootcamp. Okay, no, okay, cool. Raise your hand, full stack, raise your hand. Full stack, okay, front end, raise your hand. Data, raise your hand. Cool. Uh, let's see, we got uh, cybersecurity. Raise your hand. Okay, well represented. Cool. Okay, that helps. Thanks. Super excited for uh, the two panelists tonight. Uh, sorry, yeah, you're totally right. Totally right. UI UX, raise your hand. Yeah. All right. Um, first of all, <laughs> first of all, round of applause for everyone that graduated because it's not easy to graduate. So. Props to all of you guys <laughs> for grinding it out. Um, it's awesome. Uh, I'm excited for the two panelists because collectively between Becky and Paul, they've hired over a thousand people. So they've been on the other side of the table. And for you to be able to get a glimpse into how they think, how they make decisions, how they hire or not hire, um, hopefully is the kind of information you really can't find anywhere else. And so we're gonna go, we're gonna bounce around from a on a lot of different topics, sort of like a pinball. So hopefully you can keep up. Uh, the, uh, this entire thing is being recorded. Uh, in the next week or two, you'll get a link to it. So if we gloss over something, you're like, man, I didn't quite absorb what that is. Worry not, you'll be able to go back and watch it all over again. Uh, but feel free to make a note to yourself or maybe on your phone at roughly what point in the, in the conversation, 20%, 50%, 80% that we talk about something that you wanna go back and revisit. Um, there's a lot of topics that we're not going to talk about, mainly because it's very easily accessible. So things like, what are red flags to employers? There's a thousand free blog posts out there where you can easily and quickly learn to your heart's delight. So we're really gonna get into some of the weeds that isn't talked about or discussed very much. And so hang tight, if there's a topic or two that seems a little slow or not relevant to you, we are bound to get to some topics that are going to be very relevant to you as you ramp up your career. A lot of stuff that, I'm not exaggerating, should save you a lot of time, 50 to 100 hours of pain and anguish. If you can just get one insight from tonight, hopefully it's gonna save you a lot of pain down the road. So please give it up a warm applause for Paul and Becky. Come on up guys. You didn't bring your wine with. Come on. We're not going to spend a lot of time on bios, they're online, plus you can uh, look them up on their LinkedIn page, which is also on the event page. Um, but it'd be nice to know what your companies do. So Paul, what company are you working for right now and what exactly do they do? So 20 plus years as a tech recruiter here in town, uh, usually as a consultant, so helping companies grow their teams. Currently at Granicus, a company with an office in St. Paul, although it seats 250 and currently holds about 12, uh, living the remote world. Um, and what happens June 1st when my project ends is unknown. So I will also take some of Becky's advice when I'm looking for my new clients tonight. And Paul, what, does, what problems does Granicus solve? Uh, the no filter version is, I always ask people, have you had a positive digital experience with federal, state, or local government? Most people laugh. He's shaking his head no. Granicus fixes that. That's the short, easy version. Becky, you work for a company, a startup called Anno, A-N-N-O, Anno.ai. Um, can you tell us what Anno does? Yeah, hi, um, thanks for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I don't think your mic is on. It does. Okay, it's on, okay. okay. Um, Alan, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, Anno AI, okay, so I've been at Anno for six months. Um, we are kind of, um, originally, what we do is we have a vision detec detection service. So. Long story short, we, I'll give you the example because it's easier this way. Um, you walk into uh, a mall and our product uh, with sensors can 
uh, monitor or track someone um, physically in a building, um, either entering, maybe it's a person of interest, um, from one point to another point. So it's um, artificial intelligence with machi machine learning. Uh, it is very new technology, um, and we primarily work with um, our, our revenues coming from government um, right now, so FBI, CIA, um, to name a few, but we're pivoting to commercial. Um, so our, our product is technically re-ID, but it's uh, vision detection. Um, it's insane, but it's cool. Six months of a startup feels like how, many, how long in human years? You already answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Becky, Becky. I, what, I call Casey on this. What, what's your headcount of the current company? Uh, we are at, it just did this, 35 S FTEs or full-time employees, and I'd, I'd say about 25 contractors. Okay. Uh, 35 FTEs. If you had to take a guess, what, what's going to be your headcount 12 months from now? Uh, probably double in size. Okay, cool. What's your headcount right now? 1,000 global Okay. and supposed to add 350. Yeah, many, the rest of this year. How many of the 350 do you think are going to be engineers? Over half? No. Okay. Uh, probably only about 20%. Okay. Cool. So this is going to be more geared, uh, this first topic is going to be more geared towards those of you that have just graduated or are ramping, getting ready to graduate. I think one of the harder things for boot camp grads to understand is that on paper, most of you look virtually the same. Um, bootcamp grads look 95% the same on paper to an employer. And uh, you may not like that, but that is that is the truth. And so, um, Paul, you take this first. What, what can bootcamp grads do to set themselves aside from the rest and actually stand out and have a fighting chance? Understand if you ask seven HR people this question, you're going to get nine answers, and one of them will disagree with himself from the thing they said previous five minutes ago. Um, I say that because resumes do tend to look the same, right? If you think of your cohort, um, the resumes, the, the classwork you did, and some of the project work you did is the same. I think what, what boot camp folks tend to forget is that, or don't understand, is that your previous life experience actually matters, right? And so I think about the number, everyone downplays their previous life. Oh, like, I didn't write code before I got here. Yeah, but if you already worked on a team in a multicultural environment, in a stressful situation, and you gave presentations, you've already de-risked half of what we're thinking about, right? And so um, the quick story is I remember uh, I spoke with someone a couple of years ago who had been the kitchen manager at Pizza Luce downtown. Took a voluntary layoff to save two people's jobs when COVID hit. And he was like, oh, like no one's going to hire me. I'm like, oh, hold on a second. So I listed off all those things, plus most of your customers weren't sane, your, some of your staff may not have been sober. Like I went through all this stuff and he's like, I can swear? Yes. Okay. I asked what the rules are, because I have season tickets here and I swear all the time when I'm out there, right? Um, I, he's like, shit, I am employable. I'm like, I don't have to worry about you on a team, right? You already understand team and lead and follow and like, so whatever you've done in your previous life matters when you're doing your job search. It's just that usually we diminish this stuff when we don't talk about it. Awesome. Becky, any thoughts on how a boot camp grad or somebody that just doesn't have much of a technical experience can still position, position themselves well? Tell your story. Like, tell your story. What sets you apart to what Paul said, like, presentation skills, time management, dealing, like, I don't know how, to, uh, how customer service or anything that was facing that way, like that's, it's hard. And p if you haven't been, you know, if people haven't been it, they don't understand, um, give those skill sets and those things. It'll, it actually sets you apart. And I don't want to call them soft skills, but it sets you apart from those that are graduating just out of college with, you know, a four year degree that have never, you know, worked apart, worked, some of them now, I, I shouldn't say this, but haven't even worked a job up through that point. So. You're, you're one step ahead already, but tell your story. Um, and I will just say this, and I don't know if we're gonna hit this, but cover letters are a good thing. That's where you can tell a lot of that story. It's super important, I read them. Um, nobody sends them, or we leave it optional. But tell your story in that cover letter and what sets you apart. And if a cover letter isn't asked for, your email where you're, you're attaching your resume is now your cover letter, right? There's different ways to, mm -hmm. to get to this. Cool. Um, Why are you smiling? A cover letter was going to be one of our, our questions, so this is good. Uh, 
Let's talk about getting your foot in the door, okay? And I wanna make sure that we all understand who all the actors are that matter. So in a, inside of a company, there's an HR team. Nestled oftentimes, sometimes, but not always, is a recruiting team. And then there's a hiring manager. Becky, how might you advise a bootcamp grad to think about how to get their foot in the door and the pros and cons to potentially trying to approach the company from different angles? Keeping in mind that oftentimes the hiring manager is unknown or not as visible, and you kind of have to guess uh, who the hiring manager might be. But if, it, if a bootcamp grad has a good idea what, what that they want to work for a particular company, and there's, a, there's 101 ways to approach it, how might they think about HR, recruiting, and the hiring manager as different people that are worth approaching, and how they should think about maybe who's worth approaching first? Any thoughts? Yeah. Um. I'll speak, so smaller, smaller company, um, have been in companies up to, up to 200. Um, I would honestly start, and you might, some people might disagree with this. Um, I actually am a big believer, like when I get an email um, directly to me, or our CEO gets an email that's very well like thought out and told your story and why you think that you'd be a good fit for the role, you've done your research, you put it in the email, um, or even our CTO, nine times out of 10, I get those, those emails that go to our CEO or CTO get forwarded to me. And they're like, hey, a possible candidate. Cause all they know in, in their mind is like, hey, we have, we have open positions. It's a really competitive market right now. We have people directly reaching out to us. So like nine times out of 10, they just do a forward and you know, then it's on me to, to, to assess and deal with it. Um, I would, I, I encourage you to try that, to do that. Um, personally, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And it's not just, hey, I'm interested in working at your company in the full stack dev position. You gotta tell your story, you gotta ex explain why someone should take a look at you versus anyone else. But the second that leader, senior leader sees that you put some effort and detail into that, they'll forward it on. Yes. Cool. That's it. I would, if you're gonna submit a resume, follow up with a human, right? Like the worst thing that's gonna happen is they're not gonna get back to you which most companies aren't getting back to you anyway, so who cares, right? Like, try to double down and talk to a human, send them a message, this is why you wanna have a conversation with me, right? We also live in the land of passive aggressive, right? So again, if the CTO sends Becky or I an email, like, we're like, kinda like beholden to actually reply to somebody. Yeah. Because if we don't, we make that person look like a jerk, right? So yeah, contact someone, like be a little more aggressive, because by the way, no one does. Generally speaking, no one does this. And so, do even, it. Even a direct, um, like, LinkedIn message, I'll even look at those, and not, like, look at those, and I, I'd be open to considering if they're thought out and well-written, and not, not if I can tell someone's just going at it and throwing them at everybody, um, but if they're well thought out and written, I'll, I'll look at them that you took the time to do that. It's like, it's a, it's a plus. And companies, sh well, I will say this, a good company that's, that thinks about their brand um, should get back to, yes. <laughs> back to all of their candidates in some fashion, but it doesn't happen. Okay. A quick note on email, 90% um, of the time it's first name dot last name at URL, right? So you can always just start with that uh, and see if it bounces or not, and it'll bounce within 30 seconds. There's a slightly uh, easier way to do this, by the way. I'm gonna get nerdy for a minute. Do a search where you do an asterisk. Yes. Uh, uh, or uh, quotation mark, asterisk, space, 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 at the domain name dot com quotation marks, usually tells Google that you're looking for an email address. And so like if you do it at Best Buy, right, like you gotta go to page like 17 on the search results before you see it's first name dot last name. But I'm guessing at Becky's company you're gonna find jane.doe or jdoe at within like seconds, right? So if you find the title on LinkedIn, you know who the human is, now you know how to do the email address. Sure, it takes you a few minutes to figure this out, but a few minutes is way better than just waiting. I don't do good at waiting. <laughs> Casey, hold on. Most, Love it, thanks. Most companies should have it on their website to, in some fashion. And I would encourage you, like, 
I would also encourage you not only email the talent at you know anno.ai, but also throw one at the info or the general like information line too. Guess what? Someone's going to say, "Hey, it's my job to forward that too," and it just gets a little extra view. If you're technical and you're coming to them, like right off the bat, you are, yeah. like that's already like you're already forty percent the way there. Um, so they will they will make sure you find the right person within the company. And also, Becky was mentioning as long as it's well crafted and doesn't feel like it, it's the copy and paste. Um, people that like any of these two or any hiring manager, any VP of engineering, um, they can tell within like four seconds of reading whether it's copy and paste, whether it's generic, something that you have sent out to a hundred different employers. Uh, so 60 seconds take, goes a long ways in actually crafting one where it's customized to the company, customized to the pain you're solving, customized to the customer base that they serve. And in, in the event that you feel like, I don't have a story to tell, try to think about any connection or link you might have to the industry that the company's in. Did you have a parent that worked in it? An uncle, an aunt, a mentor? Did you yourself, maybe in high school, work at something that was adjacent to this? Mention it, bring it up. Um, let's keep going on different roles within a, a, a company. If you were graduating from a boot camp, um, do you, would you think about HR and recruiting differently than the hiring manager? And would you think of going after one than the other to increase your odds? Do you go after both of them? Um, how might you think about the hiring manager in this equation? Um, and in this case, it would probably just mean finding on LinkedIn the appropriate leader with the right title. Paul, why don't you take this first, then Becky. So Becky nailed it earlier, right? Slightly expanded on that. If I'm applying at a company with 100 people or less, I'm going to email a CEO. I guess down. They're easy to find, right? If you get above 100, then you probably need to find a CTO, a VP of engineering, a VP of product, a chief data scientist, something like that. Probably do that up to about 200 people. Um, after that, like if you're trying to find someone at Best Buy, like I'm going to look for a software development manager, like I'm going to, again, because you email the CTO at Best Buy, I mean, it would be a hell of a story. Uh, but I'm not thinking that's all that likely. Um, I, I always suggest that you say, uh, send an email to a person with a title. You know, my name is, I am a, I applied for, I, this is my language, by the way. Like I appreciate this might be aggressive, but like I'm really curious about your company and I want to learn more and I wanted to reach out to you. I appreciate you may not be the most appropriate person, but can you forward me on to the one who is, right? Years ago, I heard this phrase, network gravity, the concept that you can start high up in a tree like an apple and fall down within, but if you start at the bottom and work your way up, good luck. Not to say that Becky and I are at the bottom of the tree. Um, <laughs> but you get what I'm saying though, right? Like the other thing is this, is that frequently, if you have a job right now and you're thinking about doing a job search later this year, start now. Like reach out, right? It's easier to buy a car when you have a car and easier to buy a house when you have a house, right? It's easier to find a job when you have a job. There's a one about dating, but I'll skip that. Um, <laughs> but, but the idea is that like reach out to people now, make friendships and relationships now. Because here's the thing, Becky in your startup, I'm assuming you know roughly what a hiring plan looks like the rest of the year if you meet most of the goals. At Granicus, I can't tell you what we're hiring in Q3 and Q4. I don't know, I don't have the visibility. I only know Q2, maybe July, right? But if you email a CTO and you say, will you be, are you looking for someone like me now or in 2022? Because we normally ask yes and no questions. Are you hiring now? Do you want to talk to me now? Well, what about August and what about September? What about next year, right? After you have a year's worth of experience where you are. And so the, the last one to this is that, um, again, we live in the land of passive aggressive. Great, you're not looking for me now. Can I contact you again in six months? No one in the Midwest will say no because it's against our nature. So, okay, like five months and 30 days from now, you send an email to me and saying, hey, you may not remember me, or you hit reply all on that email where I said you could contact me again, because I, I gotta recognize this, right? So like take advantage a little bit of how we're wired in the Midwest, you know, and, and just say, can I make friends with you? Because most of us will say yes. We're not weird alien creatures, most of us. If you do get time with someone, like, maybe I'm jumping ahead, but if you do get in and you start talking with someone or you've had any point of, like, information sharing with someone, a really, like, way to set yourself apart, and it, I mean, you should be doing this anyways, it's like, if you're interviewing, but 
handwritten thank you notes, I know it seems so, and like, I know you guys are like, oh my gosh and stuff, but like, it goes a long, long ways. And even if you can look up the company address, put the name on it, attention, attention to, like, that will raise some eyes. Nobody does it anymore. And maybe it's just an old school way I was raised, but it's, it's a, uh, like, it, it shows that you're going above and beyond. Um, I have a whole folder, um, just me, um, with people that I'm like, potential future and I, I categorize them by you know team or function or department whatever and like just for future because like you know I know what we're I do know almost what we're hiring for the rest of this year but I have ideas like about future and I'm like well this person would be really good but we're not quite there yet yep. or you know I know we're going to be expanding this team um, we just did that with our machine uh, ML team so let's talk about money and uh to squeeze in this tonight and still get a lot of networking in, we're not gonna have time for Q&A, but if you hear something that Paul and Becky talk about and you wanna unpack it a little bit further, by all means come up to them and ask them. Or you have a special situation that you find yourself in and you'd love to hear their take, come up immediately afterwards and find them. Do not um, leave this room. I, I would hate for you to go home Do tonight. not leave this room if you've got questions. Oh. Or reach out to me on LinkedIn, I will respond. Yes. There we go. Um, but say it from this end. <laughs> Just kidding. So Becky, when you're hiring for a role, and you tell the candidate like that the salary for this role is $98,000. Explain to us where that number comes from. Who comes up with that number? A couple different or weird places where it comes from. Um, so uh, our company particularly, um, one, one area where we go from is we use a compensation benchmarking tool. We use Radford, um, Culpepper, there's a couple of them, or a lot of them out there I should say. Um, and basically how those work is just uh, companies, you know, submit their data for what they're paying people. You code all your jobs. They submit what they're currently paying them, and then um, companies, on a quarterly basis, they kind of refresh the data. So we have current what people are paying, and they do it by percentile, average, etc. Um, so that's one data point. It's not the tell-all, end-all. Um, also, current team. So where people are, are at on our current team, um, from like a junior to mid to senior level. My company, just due to size, is just getting to the point where we're defining like, okay, here's our kind of ranges. I, I, I won't say even salary bands right now, but ranges for junior, mid-level, or senior from an engineering standpoint. Um, and honestly, like at the end of the day, it really depends on like how bad we need we need that role filled and like if we're willing to flex flex a little bit on it. So um, right now, the strat, like what works for our company or what works good for us is I'm pretty upfront like, um, I, w I would like to have an open, I like to kind of touch the candidate first if possible and say, hey, let's have an open conversation. I want to know what, like, what offer would make you excited? Like what would actually make you excited and consider like coming on board? Um, and that will tell me a lot right there. Um, if it's, you know, way over, like, I mean, I know there's no way we're going to get there. There's not really any point to like wasting, I didn't say wasting people's time, but if, if we're not going to get there. Um, but right now the market's hot, you guys. Like you're in a like you are in the driver's seat. I'm telling you that, um, you know. But yeah, so uh, not to share too much in that. But there you go. Go after. <laughs> uh, Paul, when you share that the comp number with a candidate, how much flex is there in that number, and who internally decides if to flex? So part of it depends on like, like actually who you're applying to, right? A startup may have more room to maneuver. Uh, Granicus is private equity backed. It's fairly rigid. And then of course there's always the it depends. Uh, I, because Granicus is headquartered in Denver and we post in the state of Colorado, we have to post our job, our salaries ranges. Uh, in New York City, you have to start doing it in California, it will be sooner than later. So as a quick side note, as a job seeker, I'm gonna see if that company I'm applying to happens to be in the state of Colorado or posting jobs in Colorado, because then I already know what the salary range for the role is, right? Um, I can now again, um, for non-tech roles, the range is kind of what the range is in this economy. Um, for tech roles, uh, I can, like I don't wanna be like, hey, I don't wanna make it sound like it's a used car lot and I'm gonna go talk to my manager and see what I can get for you. But there is actually a little bit of that right now. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, like we've been looking for six weeks or six months, mm -hmm. and we're like seven grand apart. Like, can we get five more or a signing bonus or something? Um, 
two quick thoughts. One is if you are in a role right now, I'm just going to make up a number, okay? If you're in a role right now and you're making 100 grand, in your next role you're able to get 135. Do not, do not move your standard of living to 135. It is likely that when you, two years from now, when the market softens up a little bit, you're not going to get 135 or you're not going to get to 150 like you think you will today. Pocket it, invest it, put it in your mattress, I don't care. But what's going to happen is people right now are taking roles and they're, gonna, they're getting locked in. I have to work here for the next six years even if it sucks. Because they're going to their, their next role, they're going to go backwards. Okay? Inflation has happened with salaries because of West Coast tech companies recruiting in the Midwest. Right? So use that to your advantage. But just be wary, right? The market's going to change, right? There is what a what is it now, a three and a half chance, a 10 that we're going to have a recession in 2023. Should be shallow, shouldn't be a big deal, sure is, should, so it shouldn't be like the last one. That's a third cup of um, <laughs> But like, be thoughtful about what you're doing with your career and how you're planning it out. Uh, when it goes back to negotiating, one last quick thing on that one is, you don't have to just negotiate salary. Can you get a greater education stipend? If they aren't doing um, flexible time off or unlimited PTO, can you get an extra week? Because that doesn't come off on an Excel spreadsheet, right? It's not going to affect the budget somewhere. Um, can you get half days on Fridays in the summer? Like, you can talk about these things. I mean, the worst thing someone's going to say is no. But sometimes it's way easier, like, if they've got an education budget for 1500 bucks to ask for five grand than it is to ask for $3,500 more on a salary number because it's going to affect the Excel spreadsheet somewhere. So just kind of get out of the, I just want to raise the money part because by the time you do a cell phone stipend, you do an internet stipend, if you can get some more education, you may have already increased your salary, your total comp, five or seven grand, without really impacting the budget. Becky, are there any other things that you've seen technical candidates negotiate? Equity. Okay. Equity. Um, and this is, and just so you know, equity, this is, not the targets and the Amazons and the Best Buys of the world, but this is much smaller companies, generally under, let's say, 300 headcount. Um, you can ask, you can say, is, is equity on the table? And then that's a separate conversation than cash, but mm -hmm. please continue. Yeah, um, I'm always, uh, especially like when a candidate understands that like that's kind of, we have that to offer ahead of time or ask if, if it's on the table, it's already showing me their understanding kind of where we're at as a company. Um, equity is not a, it, it, I'd say we have more wiggle room with that, um, or I'd say a greater range. Um, it's not, uh, again, it's not guaranteed income or earnings, but it could, it could pay off very well. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons like that I, like when I very early on when I started like kind of getting into the tech, into, like startup tech scene, I was like, this is really cool. It doesn't, and it doesn't always pay off, but doesn't hurt to ask and I'd say nine I, I would think most company like in companies like mine um, they can I've seen a lot more flexibility like if I have to run it up let's just say the CEO or hiring manager they're like yep no no big deal um, and again and Becky I'm glad you brought this up uh, if you get equity in a startup like maybe the startup turns out to be a massive success and your equity turns out to be worth something big um, some of the first like the, if you were a first 50 employee of uber you were, you were made a decamillionaire. Um, that is not normal, that is rare, but it can happen. Um, I know of quite a few people that were first 15 or 20 hires in some startups and they ended up making seven figures when the company was acquired eight years later. So it, it takes a long time, but equity can be something extra. And if it's a smaller company, always, always, always bring it up. And I usually work with startups, but you're also kind of giving an interest-free interest loan on the income you otherwise could have made. So I'm big on startups, okay? But it's like you can, you, you can either usually get like future college kid tuition money, minor life altering money, like maybe you pay off a mortgage. And then you have the like I'm done rarity, right? But just know that if you're swapping income, salary for equity, you are giving an interest free loan on a hypothetical on a one day that's gonna invest over the next four years. So I am pro startup, but just be aware of what you're walking into when you have these conversations. And there's a lot of good blog posts out there. If you just want to type in uh, negotiating equity at a startup, uh, you'll find a lot of good uh, insights and step-by-step -step about what questions to ask and how to talk about that with the company. Um, 
Anything else about uh, negotiating comp or negotiating perks that you guys want to bring up that we didn't cover? You mentioned sign-on bonuses. Those are I, so I didn't I didn't mention that one. Okay. So there is this idea like can you get an extra three grand or five grand on the sign-on bonus because again it's not going to necessarily impact the hiring manager's budget for the year. I would I would. Um, I'm super transparent when I do my work. Some of us are, most of us aren't, right? Like I will tell you what the salary range is. I will tell you where I think we're coming in at. I will, from in the first conversation. If I'm you, like I am going to ask sooner than later, when are we going to have a salary conversation though? Because I do not want to go through three or four rounds of interviews, wait two and a half weeks to find out that we are X number of grand apart. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate again that in Minnesota, like it's not polite to ask money questions. I just filtered my first F bomb. That. Um, like, you need to take some control over this stuff, right? Um, if they're not bringing up salary in the first conversation, politely ask, when do we talk total comp things? And I can be patient and tell them. Again, I have this weird thing of, I'm not a control freak, but if I don't know what's going on, I can be a lunatic, right? Like, emotions start getting played, and what about this, and what about that? And like, but if you could just tell me, like, how this, Interview process is going to go, that would be great. By the way, ask that question. What's the interview process like in the yep. first interview? Like, how long might this take? Because you know you're thinking, I'm interviewing at three other places besides yours, and I want to try to get an offer at the same time versus waiting, right? Becky offers you on Monday, and I'm going to wait till next Wednesday. But Becky's offer might be off the table. So ask, how long might this take? What's the number of steps in the process? And I think a good a good recruiter or hi, like hiring manager, they should ask you what what timeline. Where are you at in the process? Are you talking to other companies? Are you just starting? Are you because um, you got it? That timing is key. Mm -hmm. it, it, it can be a big big I would say issue down the road, but I've seen that happen. Um, and then you know you're scrambling to fit interviews in or vice versa um, to to get offers out there. Ask Becky or I or the CTO, what is your hiring, what is your urgency to fill this role? Yep. And by the way, if they give you that awkward pause, you already know it's going to be a while, right? Well, uh, oh, crap, right? For us, it's like, I got two weeks, let's go. Yep. And the thing to understand is that if you're talking to somebody that's on the recruiting side of things, they are the air traffic controllers for talent. Mm -hmm. So they have timelines. They've got a lot of moving parts they need to coordinate. So for them, they know what their timeline is. Like they know how things need to fall together in the next couple of weeks or month. Um, so uh, feel free to grill them on that because that's a core part of what they're thinking about every single day. Hey, I got another one. Ask Go. somebody when's the next, when am I gonna hear from you again? Yeah. And then hold us accountable. So just for the record, oh crap, this is on camera. I haven't done so well the last two weeks. There's been some family stuff going on that has impacted my day job. And I have some candidates tonight that I will have to send an email to say, I'm sorry. Here's what's been going on with me personally. Uh, but I know right now there are at least six people right now somewhere in the United States who are wondering how they stand with us today. And that sucks. Like, yeah. That I always think about, again, it's back to the employee brand experience. and like, Because even if you don't get the job, you can still look back and say, hey, like that was, you know, that was a good experience. You never know what future potential opportunities would be there. Um, I will also try to be very upfront. Like if I know a hiring manager or someone on the team is gonna be on vacation. And one thing we're really working on is making sure we have like more than one person who can interview, you know, we do we do a team interview or that are, and there's people, we have backups to the backup so people can fill in um, if needed. We don't wanna hold up the process. We wanna move as as quick as possible, if, it, if needed. Here's five level deep on this one. When you're getting set up, because I had a candidate today do a panel interview, so I proactively sent them a link, uh, the name, the title, the LinkedIn URL, and what I know about this person who's going to be in the interview. Mm -hmm. If I'm job, if I'm going to be on that, if I'm going to be the interviewee, and I haven't provided that information, I am going to ask, can you tell me who's going to be on this interview, what their title is, um, is there anything you could tell me about them? And by the way, can you give me any like sort of side info on like what kind of questions they might ask? I've gotten that a lot lately, the side info questions. Yeah. Like, I like it though. Because the hard part is, right, I had someone today, oh crap, this is on camera. Um, we had four people they were going to be on a panel with, and I told our team, please do not turn this into an interrogation. Yeah. 
please make sure that we are interviewing this person the same way you would want to be interviewed. Right? But then I'm going to ask, if I know that there are four people who are going to, I'm going to ask, what's the flavor of this interview going to be like? Like, is it going to be rapid fire questions for the first 60 minutes so that I know how much Diet Mountain Dew to drink before we do it? <laughs> right? Because, like, I'm ready. Can I ask questions? Can I engage? Should my answers be long or short? Right? Because some people want more info. Some people tune out after 15 seconds. Ask questions. Also ask, too, are there going to be coding tests? Like, yes. that's a big, a big one that, like, people just like want to be prepared for. So I've been, get, I've been asked that quite a few times. So what, what are they if they are? Um, we'll, you know, I, we'll try to give you as much information as possible. Um, but I like it that it looks like you guys are like trying to prepare and plan you know, for your best, best interview possible. It, you're, you're, again, you're setting yourself the bar. As a job seeker, right, we're already on someone else's home field. I want to know as much as I can not to level the playing field, so to speak, but I want to try to figure out, like, how is this going to go? How is this going to feel so I can mentally and emotionally prepare for what's about that, you know, what I need to do that day? Cool. And I just want to remind everyone, to don't, don't stop asking questions. Like, ask a lot of questions early on. They're kind of like your, your tour guides as you walk down this path that you've never walked down before. They want to see you succeed. They want to see mm -hmm. this go well for you. They are mentally, emotionally, and so, somewhat financially vested to see you cross the finish line. Lean on them. They are your tour guide. Can you, uh, Becky, can you give an example of a candidate that you've had that did negotiate the comp package up front and how they did it? They did negotiate up front? Yes. Um, like what part of, when you say up front, how up front do you, do you mean? Uh, you, you can interpret that however you want, but uh, where, the, an offer was presented, they managed to get you from here to here. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear you unpack um, how, how, did, how were they able to do that? What did they present? What did they bring to the table? What did they bring up? What kind of leverage did they manufacture for themselves that were, were able to get you guys higher than where you originally were? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think, again, and this is where I think in Minnesota, well, Midwest especially, uh, people are uncomfortable with kind of tooting your own horn. So again, um, I think it's going back um, once you've received maybe the initial offer. Um, and I'll just say, I am my personal brand, like I'm not gonna give an offer that I don't think you're gonna be excited about. It doesn't feel good to really lowball anyone. I don't know, at least in my, my role it doesn't, it's horrible. Um, but then coming back from that, um, I think it's laying out to the the reminding you know the recruiter and the team um, this the the what sets you apart. So it's kind of going back to your offer letter, but what skill set, what experience? Now you've also kind of gotten a peek behind the curtain of what's going on. What do you think you could maybe help with of the things that you you of the knowledge you gained up, the problems the company's like trying to solve? No company's perfect. They have problems. There's skeletons in there. Like how can you help them better enable it? Um, Here's an example of one that we just had. Um, we, uh, for our ML team, um, teams expanding and growing, um, we kind of, we had a mid, I'd say mid-level uh, ML engineer come in, um, super, you could just tell, like super high leadership potential, but uh, he raised his hand in the negotiation and said, I'm willing to uh, mentor and coach uh, junior, junior ML engineers that we're bringing on, and, and like that's a, you don't always get that. Um, so anything like you're willing to step up, take on additional responsibilities, help coach, mentor, uh, like I'm, I'm just like things like that that set you apart um, goes above and beyond. Um, you know your just typical day day job duties or regular duties, I guess. Weird squirrel moment. Uh, ask if this role has on call responsibilities. Ask what a day or a week in the role of this is like so that you can judge if this is something you want to be doing. Because we don't always, not by, not with purpose, but we don't always, here's every role and responsibility, but if I'm a job seeker, I want to know if I'm working on Saturdays. I want to know if I'm, like, right, if you're a dev, right, and you've got a deadline and you're, you're, you're pushing something out Friday, this week's going to suck, okay? But do I get some time off next week to recuperate? Like, ask, like, what is, what is, what is doing, new code, like what's it like when it goes into production? What is it like when it, like what does this mean, right? Because 
this week is not next week is not like the one in the middle of July. Get some sense of what the role is like so that you can start figuring out what do you want to ask for, right? Maybe the role is better than, like I've had, a, I've had three candidates in the last two weeks say, I'll take a cut and pay. If you can have me be remote and I don't have to work more than a 45 hour work week, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Because they're working their butt off, filter, um, and they're like, and I, and I had a guy say to me today, they're like doing an hour and a half, an hour and a half one way commute in LA by the way, um, and he's like, he's like, no, I won't do this anymore. He goes, I don't need a remote role, but if I only need to go in one hour or one day a week and it's only gonna be a half an hour, which in LA doesn't really exist, but cool. Like, so often we think of just what the bottom line is. How's this gonna impact my life? Or I wanna have kids, or I've got an aging parent, because I do. How does this role impact the rest of my life? And sometimes, Taking a lateral isn't such a bad thing either if you can cut your hours, cut your stress, more time with your family and your kids. There's a, uh, I mentioned this earlier, so there was an article in the last couple of weeks, Wall Street Journal somewhere, somebody did a survey, 30, 32% of the people who've taken a job in the last year are looking for a new job already. Grass is not greener on the other side. Ask questions. More money isn't always the answer. And pedigree is not always the answer too. Oof. There's. Um the hottest startups, the Zooms and the Slacks of the world, are have hundreds and hundreds of burned out engineers because 2021 and 2022 so far have just been breakneck. Um, so pedigree is not always the answer as well, depending on if you want to optimize for lifestyle or not. Uh, Becky, back to you. I, I want to I want to parse a little bit more about Mr. ML engineer. So when he volunteered to mentor up and coming ML uh, engineers, was that was that offer that he gave to you also coupled with a if you pay me more how did he frame that in the conversation that he's having with you guys um i'll just throw out a number i, I don't remember exactly what the details were but um he was asking for like i think it was i can't remember five or ten grand more and he said in addition to this like here's some you know he had already talked to the hiring manager and kind of tapped this and i think basically the hiring manager is saying this is gonna be a, like something we're gonna have to address and a need we're gonna have. And he said, I'm willing to raise my hand, come in and do it. So yeah, he, he coupled it with that saying, I'm willing to step up and do this for that. Um, and it's like, it's been awesome. Um, I personally think we should be paying him more for it. Um, awesome. It's, uh, and you guys, I'm, I'm not saying you don't, but I would say from a, an HR standpoint, and I'm more, I'm, I'm HR, I've, I've done a lot of recruiting. Um, but I typically have recruiters on, on a team. Um, engineers aren't always, like, don't always want to go the leadership route. And I think that's, like, something that people think, like, everyone wants to do. And there's going to come a point in time, if you maybe already have been there, that you're like, no, I want to be an IC or an individual contributor. And that's okay, too. I would also be very, like, also this, too. Be open and say that, too, in your interview process. Like, you know, a lot of people will say, what is... What is you know what does the career path look like or what does that look like and I'll answer back well what 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 is it what are you wanting to get out of that too but be prepared for that that question too about um, like what do you think you're gonna want to do because I know a lot of super talented uh, burned out uh, engineers too that like oh I'd love if they would they would take on leaders like a leadership role too and they just they don't you know it's, that's a whole nother gig. <laughs> Well, okay, squirrel moment. So if you are, uh, a, if you're a senior product person and you like being a good senior product person but you don't want to be a director of product, say so. Because normally what happens, right, in fast moving tech companies, the person who gets promoted is the one who's doing that best job, but they may suck as a manager or director. And a lot of us, and I'm one of them, I do not want Becky's job, you're good. I don't want to manage anybody. I'm cool being me, doing my role, busting my butt. To manage seven of me sounds like hell. Okay? Like, just, I don't want to. You may end up, though, plateauing at your current company or your future company down the road, right? That's okay. Like, find someone who's good with, someone who can do this role, kick butt at it. I, I don't know. I just, I'm not fancy with titles. And so, that's me projecting. I'm guessing some of you feel the same way because there's about a third of you nodding, right? Like, I, I don't, um, 
I don't want to do budgets and one-on-ones, and I don't want to do annual reviews, and I don't want to do those messy things. I'm cool if someone's got to do it for me. Let's get rid of annual reviews. I mean, seriously. Uh, who likes doing those? <laughs> um, but, if, but if you do want to go, I know we went way squirrel off your question. If you do want to go like a leadership track or you think you might be interested in doing something that say so up front, like at the beginning, say aspiration wise, like this is something I think I'd be interested in. I'm willing to bet a lot of you out there maybe in previous careers and stuff have that in you. I don't know, I could be wrong and maybe I'm making a, 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 a wrong assumption, but um, I think a lot of you probably have some of those leadership skills from past experience already in you and if you think you can, you know, take, but I, I will say the le I feel like the leaders are, are working a little bit longer hours than what I've seen in the last two years. Got it. I want to beat one more case study out of you and then we're going to do some rapid fire questions. Um, Paul, can you, can you think of an example of a candidate that was able to negotiate their comp? May not be cash, maybe other stuff too, and what that conversation looked like? Well, let's be clear, this is not a granicus situation. Because I, look, I always say to folks, like I'm gonna, part of, for me in recruiting though, because my answer is a little bit different, is I always tell everybody up front, even if I don't have to disclose the salary range, what a salary range is. And I'm gonna explain to a candidate up front, like before like that last interview, here's where I think we're, we, we spoke about it in the first conversation. You've had now, uh, you've now met with the hiring manager, you've done a code review of some sort if you're, if you're a developer, right? Um, you're walking in virtually now, really, right to a final interview. I wanna talk salary right before that. What do you think and how does it feel? By the way, this is what my manager's thinking, if I know, or I will call you within 24 hours after this final interview. I don't like to play the game. I don't think most of us like to play the game. And so thankfully I get to project that with most of my clients that like, why are we, why do we make this so hard? I wanna make it so that when Casey starts on June 1st, Casey won, the hiring manager won, the team's excited, I'm thrilled because I know he's good. Maybe everybody gave up a little bit, but cool, right? Like this doesn't have to be a zero sum, win, lose, I'll quit the rant, because there's a really long one coming. <laughs> like, ask questions. And you're gonna get a good idea right away if, if you're speaking with someone like Becky who wants to work with you and wants to talk to you and wants to ask you questions and is actually listening to you, that's where I wanna go to work, right? If someone's like, we've got 15 minutes for this conversation, we gotta talk this fast, let's go, and by the way, for me, not for me. It's not an answer to your question, but it's, I think that, um, how many minutes do we have? Um, I despise the phrase human resources. I, I hate the word hate. I hate talent acquisition and don't get me started on human capital. Because yeah. dear Lord, could we make it sound any more like we are replaceable widgets, industrial revolution, 1800. But yeah, we still do it, right? We need to find a way to start making this more human and we want to start be treating more human like, right? So ask questions, learn more. And if someone doesn't, particularly in this market, you can, cool, you're not for me. The hardest part is if you have to take a job for the sake of taking a job because your finances require it, that changes this equation entirely. But if you have, if you're good right now, be reasonably picky. And chances are, if you're getting like, Go with your gut. Yes. So like some of the things he's saying, like if it's very like, I don't want to say like robotic, but if it, if it doesn't feel right, like, and it's not feeling right at that point, like where they should be, you know, there should be like confetti. I mean, they're, they, they're trying to woo you in, right? Make, if it's, they feel it's right, but like, it's probably not going to be much better down the road. I mean, it might be okay for the initial, but um, it, it, yeah. Casey knows this. I always relate everything back to dating. Right, like you're doing your job search and you're trying to figure out when do I call back? What should I wear on a Zoom? Uh, how do I talk about my ex-employer? Um, here's what I really want. You're just laughing your tail off now. Um, but right, but that's the thing though. And then for recruiting though, it's the same thing because we've got baggage, hiring managers have baggage, right? Like, it's just this, I don't know where this thing got so jacked up that we can't actually say, hi, my name is, and be honest, and have somebody be honest with us, and can we get rid of all of the angst that's in this room as we even have this conversation today? 
So find yourself some employers who think that way. They are out there because that's where you want to work anyways because you're right. What it's like going in is what it's like going to be there when you're there, generally speaking. Right? If you've got to go through a circus to get into a company, it's going to be a circus. I opt out for that. All right, some rapid fire questions. They do not require rapid fire answers, so take your time on them. Number one, uh, a well-filled out LinkedIn profile that you spend time on. Is that important, yes or no, and why? Paul, go. Yes. Okay. You gotta tell your story. Okay, cool. Becky? I wish resumes were gone. I wish it was all LinkedIn. Yeah, right on. Um, very good. And uh, cover letters, necessary, yes or no, why? I, I say yes. Okay. Necessary, no, would I send one, absolutely. Uh, and I, I agree. The number of hiring managers I know that will immediately disqualify you if you don't have cover letter because they will deem you as either lazy or simply not not treating them like an employer you actually want to work for, but just one of 100 that you're spraying and praying for. Um, the lack of a cover letter is, is probably the clearest signal possible that you're just spraying and praying. And no employer wants to hire you if you're just like, if, if they f sense that you're just one of 126 employers that you are um, trying to score a phone call with. Um, hybrid, okay, so a hybrid company. So they say, hey, you can come in four days a week, one day a week, or even zero days a week. If you pick zero, will you be penalized when it comes to raises and promotions? Yes or no? Becky, go. You shouldn't be. If the company offers you the, the chance to do zero days or two days or five days, that's like there should be no discrimination. Okay. There should be. I know that's not always that's, the case. There should be no. That sounds very rosy. Yeah. But like everybody under the age of like 28 right now is really fearful that because if they're not seen, not heard, then they're not producing and they're not actually like promotable, right? This is a huge raging thing in the HR world right now. And I agree that it should be this way, right? Um, I think that we're like in the third inning of a nine inning game of how the future of work is about how this is really gonna play out, of how companies, there are some companies already saying, right, like we're gonna, we're gonna be hybrid, or we're gonna be remote forever. <laughs> Not anymore. Now they're saying we wanna be back two or three days a week. Some CEOs are saying, like, I finally bought into remote hiring and we're gonna do it forever, and they mean it, right? They've let leases go. Um, this is still the part about we need to build relationships, whether they are here in this room, if they are on Zoom or a hybrid in between. At the end of the day, we still have to manage our careers in whatever format that looks like. Because if we don't, there's gonna be another recession one day. And you, I'm sorry, but I've, I'm, now this is my third. I'm 50, I call it 50 plus one. I'm in denial, it's my age. Um, I constantly think about being defensive. How do I make sure that my my um, potential client pool is big enough. What happens if this, what happens if that? And Casey's like a brother to me and he knows, he's seen me get caught this last one, as many of us did, completely unprepared. And I am not joking when I tell you it gives me night sweats. I have nightmares about the last two years. I will not, especially at my age, go through this again. I'm gonna make darn sure I am prepared, darn sure that I'm constantly motivated, because I'm in a different space, right? I'm always looking for new client or clients. I need to make sure that pipeline's always full. Not kinda, not sorta, and I appreciate that it's July and I wanna sit on the dock and not do a darn thing. Gets me broke fast, right? Like we have gotta start maintaining our careers even in good times. Good point. And for those of you that haven't gone through, through it, it, was, it, in the boom times, everyone's hiring like crazy, especially engineers like crazy, higher, higher, higher. And then as soon as the economy starts dipping, everyone puts on screeching, breaks, right? Not everyone, but many people, especially publicly traded companies who are, have to wake up thinking about their share price every single quarter and they will screech on the brakes. And so um, hiring ebbs and flows massively based on how the macroeconomic trends are doing and that even affects you as an engineer, uh, especially if you end up finding yourself at a publicly traded company. West Coast tech companies now are already reducing their hiring for Q3 and Q4 and prepare for a 2022 recovery. That gets here someday, which is to say this, we're gonna go from a euphoric 
prints 1999 to a really busy one. But it is to say that you won't have seven opportunities, you're going to have two. It is to say that your salary isn't going to go up 30%, it's going to go up 10. It's still going to be a good time. It's just not going to be this like free for all. But prepare for that. Uh, two, two quick comments on um, the engagement piece he was saying about, like, if you know you, like, ask questions about how the company, one, is doing hybrid, remote, or if they're in office, so get that information up front. And then, like, you have to decide as an individual, like, what is best for you. So right now, like, my company is pretty much remote, and I'm an extrovert, and it's, I'm, I am struggling, like, myself. And, like, you weren't, I mean, there's things that it's hard. Like, even for me, like, in it, and I, so make sure it's what you want. Ask how the company engages their teams and what things they do if they are fully remote. Like, how do you, how do you get that extra relationship building time with your team? Um, if you want it, if that's important to you. And then I'll just say this, and I'm not, the last two years, and even I know from a recruiting standpoint, like someone who does it full time, like your, your, your typical HR people, ops, I hate human capital to that word, but yes. people are very, very burned out and are still very burned out. And it's like, it's kind of, so I, I would just say patience is good too, but they're burned out. They just went through like hell and back, I'm sorry to say that, but like with everything and trying to figure out how to navigate this and it all kind of got, oh, I'm sorry, all but kind of dumped on them, like figure it out and it's like, yeah, and it's still going on. It's getting better, but just they're kind of coming out of that. Thank so. you for probably swearing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I do not know a recruiter and HR person who's not stressed out today. My West Coast tech friends, recruiter friends, can't process people fast enough. Other people can't hire fast enough. Like, I did a, post back in January um, that I said if you have a recruiter and HR person in your life personally, professionally, like reach out to them because they're not doing well. Uh, 35,000 views on LinkedIn, a couple hundred likes, a bunch of comments. So I'm just saying, you know, like I've got some stuff in the personal life that are kind of going on right now. Like I'm dragging it. Like I'm, I'm not my best recruiter self is how I sent in an email today. And I'm sorry. Like I'm doing the best I can. Hold me accountable though, right? Um, if you aren't, if you today don't have a resume ready and your LinkedIn profile ready, do that by the end of the weekend, right? Because we've already seen a couple of companies locally announce, announce layoffs. We've also seen a couple of companies get funding in the last days. Like if there was ever a time to be ready for whatever, it's now. Whether you're taking advantage of an opportunity or you're reacting to uh, some bad news. Cool. Well, thank you guys. Give it up for Becky and Paul, everyone. If you found them helpful, if you found them helpful, come up and tell them afterwards. Otherwise, how do they know? So if you liked what you heard, if you got something out of this, if anything resonated with you, please come up and thank them afterwards. Um, for those of you that have signed up for a tour and you know who you are, uh, at 8 o'clock, uh, what time is it now? Guys? Okay, in one minute, um, <laughs> meet out in the lobby in front of the desk, and that's where the tour will begin. Thanks for being here. Thanks for being good listeners. Have fun tonight, guys.